an introduction to the blank history of the blank book. And as it turns out, this is a title that has already been used by Peter Stallybrass, who works at the University of Pennsylvania. And he used it in a lecture he gave in Iowa a couple years ago, but he's given me permission to use it here today. And when I refer to books during this presentation, I will be referring to books the way we think of them, with a spine and pages that turn, though there's a lot of interesting work being done with scrolls and tablets as record-keeping structures as well. When we think about blank books, it's going to be important to remember vocabulary. Um, for much of bookbinding history, there's been the stationer's binding that dealt with books without words and letterpress binding that dealt with books with words. Today, uh, stationer's binding is rarely used and we just have the blank book and loose leaf industry. And by loose leaf, I mean uh, things like three ring binders, filofax, uh, binders for specially holed and ruled paper that's meant to organize your business and your life. It's going to be important to keep in mind for this presentation that blank book actually within its definition refers to structural features. Um, the style of binding for books meant to be written in and therefore must lie flat at any place the book is open. So now that we've gotten vocabulary taken care of, I'd like to start looking at the blank books themselves and at literature from the blank book industry to see what it begins to tell us. Now this is a book that I actually own, a blank book, that I purchased at, I must say, a rather high-end sort of bookstore. And inside it says, no part of this book may be reproduced without written permission. Now remember this is blank. What part of a blank book would you actually be worried about reproducing? before anything's been written in it. Well, inter uh, interestingly, this uh, book is covered in a reproduction of a 16th century blank book that is held at the Morgan Library in New York City. So there are things to copyright about blank books besides the content on the pages. Uh, when you look at the copy, the advertising copy on the website for Plainper Blanks, what they say about the use of this volume is, when do mundane account entries become magnificent artifacts? When they are housed in the Italian Merchant volume from 1516 to 1550. So blank books clearly are about marketing a feeling like many consumer products. Now later on in their copy you'll be interested perhaps in the choices you're offered as a consumer. Just like the Italian businessman of the 16th century, this company, this 21st century company, Paper Blanks, will still give you structural choices about how your books are put together, as if you cared. Under uh, Search by Features, you can look at bindings, and under Bindings, you can have Hand Sewn or Smythe Sewn, Smythe Sewn being a very high quality machine sewing. When is the last time you could choose between two kinds of sewing when you bought a book? So a quick look at a blank book made by a 21st century blank book company is really showing you three important truths about blank books today and in historically I would argue. One, that they are an innovative branch of the book trade heavily involved in patented systems that they guard rather carefully. Two, that they are selling you more than space to put your records on a blank page. And finally, that blank book makers pay more serious attention to book structure and to book function and how the pages move and how you're interacting with those pages than anyone in the letterpress industry, certainly today. So folks who are making books with words in them are really not giving this kind of attention to the structure as a general rule, uh, certainly with the kind of books that are available for you to buy at the store today. And if you notice at the bottom of this, uh, this slide, Two fellows are using account books from the 1600s and they're lying beautifully flat. They're doing that because they've been engineered to do so and those have been filled in by manuscript with you know, writing by hand. It's good to remember that the blank book industry is an important part of the bookbinding trade. Here's an advertisement from 1831 in Pittsburgh proudly proclaiming from the publisher that not only does he publish books with words, but he publishes blank books of every description, made of good paper, durably bound, and ruled to any given pattern. 
And here from a book on Philadelphia and its manufacturers from 1858, you can see from their reckoning that the account book binding and ruling of blank paper, the trade that trade in their city amounted to about 22% of the binding trade. Today, if you look at trade binding in 2000, it was a 2.1 billion industry, while blank and loose leaf binding is actually larger in two, uh, 2001 with 2.12 billion. Though far fewer employees, as you see, um, due to the highly mechanized nature of the industry. I think it's important to remember with those earlier statistics, it was before loose leaf bindings took over. And when I was discussing how important patenting is to the blank book industry, here in a 1903 journal for the International Bookbinding Union, where they related month by month all the new patents in the book trade, four out of the 11 relate to blank books, and especially to loose leaf systems, by which I mean three ring binders and such, where you can write on something and then put it in a separate kind of mechanical binding. And while this is not a loose leaf um, advertisement you know, for a loose leaf system, it's an interesting one. This is a patent from 1898, which is advertising his um, book that will lay perfectly flat. And he's got a new system for how you're going to do that involving a sewing machine. Now, as we saw, or perhaps began to see with that 21st century um, binding that I talked about at the beginning, the uh, copy of an Italian blank book, blank books can be beautiful as well as quite strong and practical. The distinctive look of many blank books has um, evolved through time and it reflects really uh, differences in their interior structure. This rather complicated drawing of a 16th century uh, blank book structure was really engineered to open flat and create um, an easy writing surface and even to allow you to put in and take out pages, still things uh, people think about today. And in between uh, the uh, 17th century and 1912, things really hadn't changed all that much in the blank book world, though there were patents for what the books had done before in terms of openability, in particular the springback, which is sort of a fascinatingly overbuilt structure for flat opening and durability. In the 1600s, as now, blank book makers um, made sure you knew you could pay for nice touches, the ones that would make you feel really good while you were recording your facts or your thoughts. And this could involve hand-done tooling, special brass buckles, fancy lacing patterns, various buttons and toggles to close this rather briefcase-like book as you put it under your arm. And while this strange little black Brillo pad looking device won't win any prizes for beauty, it is made by ACO, the largest loose leaf system and loose leaf blank book seller today, and he still, or she, proudly promotes this new patented structure as the ProClick that lets pages lie flat with 360 degree rotation for convenient note taking. Now that we've sort of quickly looked at how patents and status and structure operate in blank books, at least from the 1600s to the 21st century. Let's take a look at how a major blank book company tells the story of its own history. In 1943, the U.S. company, National Blank Book Company, put out a company history with 100 years of their business history with vignettes on the bottom of the various pages depicting really what they thought of as the highlights of their history and that's what I'm going to go through right now. The National Blank Book Company begins at what they think of as the beginning with Babylonian accounting tablets here. And from the Babylonians we quickly move into the codex structure with this rather colonial looking fellow writing in a book with a quill pen. And here you see the National Blank Book Company uh, moving about 400 years at a pop from the fellow alone at his desk with a pen to the secretary who is entering things with a very fancy machine onto loose leaf pages. After finishing entering her data, 
the secretary now takes it into her boss who will enter it into the proper place into his fancy loose leaf system there that clearly does all that he needs it to do. So after celebrating that change from the Babylonian tablet to the secretary at her modern typing machine and the complicated loose leaf binding structure at her boss's desk, we'll go back to the beginnings of the National Blank Book Company, which by 1843 would have involved um, leather bound books with some cloth involved, uh, traditional designs, and a focus on the spring back that patented binding meant to lay flat. The National Blank Book Company said in their book that they were slow to enter the loose leaf field because their reputation has been built or had been built on their sturdy bound structures. They were unsure if the whole thing was a fad, but they began to dominate the loose leaf field by 1910 with many patented systems. And here's a variety of these systems that could have been used with carbon paper to produce receipts and other kinds of papers. These papers had to be put into a binding and then, as now, the three ring binding was a ubiquitous product that you could buy in many, many forms and they were very proud of it. And it's clear that loose leaf still dominated probably the major sales and the loose leaf systems became extremely complicated. It's hard to open these uh, structures today, but they made a sound film that they used in their advertising to, to uh, take a look at how strong and secure these systems were. Spiral bindings were patented in Germany, but National found a very tiny little legal flaw in the U.S. filing for the spiral binding and came up with their own version named the Tumbler. And with this image of a busy office supply shop selling all kinds of interesting new uh, blank book structures, I'm going to end um, our look at, at a company history for the National Blank Book Company, which really covered a hundred years of what they saw as the most important issues they were dealing with. Now at this point, point I want to start talking about what researchers have said about blank books when they've talked about them at all. Accounting historian R. H. Parker, in his Accounting Basics chapter, which looks at uh, language, writing utensils, the structures they wrote in, numerals and calculation, it's a great chapter, and he talks about how some of the planning problems of using a bound structure and how in the 1880s and 1890s loose leaf structures began to really change how accounting works. Though he never really talks about the interplay between the record keeping world and suppliers of record keeping structures. And I really think that you can think of those who supply and make blank books as a basic element of record keeping in its social context. As it's because they're really working hard to interact with their community and evolve to meet needs. Outside the discipline of accounting history, there are other um, historians from other disciplines who are looking at record keeping from a communication point of view, a manuscripts point of view, and a legal point of view is what you see here. And in the art history world, there are those who are looking at books and paintings and even account books as allegory of various social issues in paintings. Though again, none of these are really looking at the business of blank book making. The Book History Journal recently came out with a really nice overview on paperwork, the state of the discipline, where he notes that many people are looking at the technologies of writing and the materialities of communication and looking at that despite the tendency of book history to really privilege books with words. All these historians from different disciplines are definitely including parts in their research that can be applied to blank book makers and the business of blank book making itself. And I think it would be interesting if people were to look more at the blank books themselves and those who make them and integrate that more fully into the field of book history as a whole. And one way to begin that kind of looking is to think about patents and status and structure uh, following some of the avenues that I've been able to see by my very quick look at blank book history and not such blank history.